Jillian, thank you so much for making the time for me today. Um, so the first question can be like, where were you born and raised? Ah, okay. Um, so I was actually born in a town called Arbroath, which is about 20 minutes north of Dundee. So <laughs> quite close by. It's a small, smallish, I guess, um, traditionally fishing town. Um, and yeah, I grew up there. And I think by the time I got to 18 years old, I was very keen to leave. <laughs> um, although looking back, it was really a great place to grow up, I would say. Um, it's funny when you go back to somewhere where you grew up, you see it in a different light, I think. So I moved away from there when I was 18 and went to study my undergrad in Glasgow at Glasgow University. Uh, and while I was there, I did an exchange year. So I went to New Zealand for, I was away for about 18 months um, and did a bit of traveling when I was over there. And on the way back came via Cambodia and did a bit of um, voluntary work there. And then I did my fourth year of my undergrad in Glasgow again. I moved back home for a little while and then um, decided I wasn't, <laughs> didn't want to be there for, for too long at that stage um, and went to teach English in Japan for a while. Um, yeah, and came back and, oh, what happened after that? I think at that point I realised I wanted to do something in psychology. Mm -hmm. um, my undergrad was in psychology, but I think up until that point, I wasn't quite sure where I wanted to take this. I think I was wondering, you know, <laughs> what what am I going to do with life? Um, but after I came back from that, I had a little bit more of a focus and I thought, no, I, I would quite like to do something um, in the psychology field. I really liked working with people. Mm -hmm. um, I really liked working in educational contexts. So I was doing a bit of teaching at that time. I'd kind of noticed that I'd I'd worked with children and young people at various points. Um, mm. It wasn't necessarily intentional. I guess that was just the kind of thing that I was drawn to. Um, and so at that stage, I thought, yeah, this is maybe something that I would quite like to look into a little bit more. Um, mm. And so I got an assistant psychologist job um, and, yeah, took that forward and really really enjoyed that and then wanted to pursue the training program to get onto educational psychology really <laughs> so I studied that at Dundee so I now teach on that program in Dundee and that was also the program that I trained on so that's quite nice mm. um so like from like Arbroath um Glasgow mm. and then New Zealand yeah. couple of Asian countries yeah. Japan oh my god this is quite a bit I mean yeah. Uh, you you were still very young then, isn't it? Yeah, so that was um, I think I got back from Japan um, probably when I, I was in early twenties, twenty four, twenty five, something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, um, so I think I was pretty keen to see the world <laughs> or see <laughs> parts of it at least. Um, just that awareness that there's so much more out there and being curious about it. Mm -hmm. I think yeah um like one close question can be like I mean this this I always ask like looking back mm. I mean, your parents role I mean uh, yeah. in like shaping your understanding about the world did you have any earliest memories where you know I don't know like it's like some kind of political consciousness or some kind of you know, social consciousness that kind of thing yeah do you know I think what my mum and dad always tried to kind of instill in me is a bit of a sense of social responsibility so not to sort of live in isolation but to connect yourself with others and my mum is a very um caring person and is always busy doing things for other people mm -hmm. uh, and that's a real value base of them I think is to like you know be aware of the privilege you come with I suppose mm -hmm. and I don't mean that in a you know we're not super wealthy or anything like that I just mean that the education we have in this country and um the opportunities that we have as well you know being able to 
recognize that and try and help others and be open to being helped yourself and and those kinds of values I think but and I will say as well you know part of why I um wanted to work in a university too is that some of the most formative times I can remember were actually conversations with my peers in my undergrad the friends I made there and the same again when I came back to do my postgrad I think it's a very unique feeling situation um as a young adult and then a slightly older adult um to be in a learning context and and be encouraged to be thinking and to be opening our minds and thinking again and and being critical in a healthy sort of you know open way to be curious I think mm. those conversations as well and meeting people from different places being on a campus you know it's very um energizing for me mm. Mm. and I think those principles are really important for us to support and encourage mm. I mean I, I mean I need to touch a bit our road as well. Um, I I quite love our road. I mean, it's oh, just I know it. twenty minutes drive from my place, and yeah. in the cliffs. I mean, I love those yeah. cliffs. I mean, it's yeah, they're, they're but I've got like a couple of students who actually came from our road, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know like they're they're the I, I'm still in touch with them. Uh, they're the kindest people. Oh really? <laughs> oh, that's lovely. <laughs> yeah. It? It's, it's it's like fishing town, isn't it? And the, yeah. and the, the pictures, the coastline. It is, <laughs> yeah. Do you think that kind of setting also helped growing up? Yeah, I I definitely do. I think you know, like I said earlier, I think by the time I got to eighteen, I really felt quite desperate to leave mm. because I was just itching to see the rest of the world. But looking back, I can see how beneficial I think that was in many ways because. It wasn't incredibly small, but mm. it also wasn't the size of a city. Mm. So, and you know, I remember if you were to go out on the high street on a Saturday, you were guaranteed to know the majority of people that you were passing on the street. It was quite a supportive community. Um, I mean, I think it also has, you know, that also can bring some issues too, I think. Um, but in the main, I think it felt connected enough mm. to cities you know you could go there if you wanted to and I and I mean that as well for just connection to I mean there wasn't really internet in the same way then mm. <laughs> so connection to, to a bit more of like urbanization I guess at that stage too but it also felt separate as well so you felt you did feel I think part of a community and connected to other people and aware of other people's lives and you know opportunity to 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 get to know people as well you know I still have friends now that I had when I was in primary school in nursery oh yeah and um, because families get to know each other as well I think that's mm. a big part mm. of it mm. um so like going back to your university days like when when this like psychology like came yeah so I actually studied and this was really unusual. I studied higher psychology at high school mm -hmm. um, or when I was in high school, sorry, but I had to do it as a night class in college because the high school didn't offer it. So I I couldn't actually tell you how that came around. I think it, it and this just goes to show, I think, the power of people because mm -hmm. it must have been my guidance teacher or someone in the school who thought she seems to really like people or she seems to be really interested in psychology and I don't know how this came about but I was certainly offered um to go along to night class in a college the local college Angus College to study psychology and that really kind of whetted my appetite and like I say it wasn't until another I don't know five six something like that years later mm -hmm. that I came back to that and thought oh yeah I remember I really enjoyed that actually and that was um you know kind of sparked the interest and in, in go, went going on to do my undergraduate um so yeah I think it was it was kind of accumulation of experiences I think um but specifically 
I mean, I think I was wondering, I think I noticed psychology is this massive field. <laughs> It really is. And in order to apply, you know, to work as a, an applied psychologist or practitioner psychologist, you almost always, in fact, I don't think there is any, there, there's no postgraduate, um, there's no applied psychology job that has the um, regulatory bodies attached that doesn't also require some sort of postgraduate study. Mm. So I thought, okay, if I want to be a psychologist of some kind, I need to choose <laughs> which kind of psychologist um I want to be and and like I say I think my experiences of having seen the power of education and and just how um empowering and how education and learning can open up possibilities for people that became something that I was quite keen to pursue um I did some work with this was a long time ago, some asylum seekers in Glasgow with the Princess Trust. And I remember, and that must have been maybe 2006, I think, just after my undergraduate. Um, and I remember them talking about their aspirations and one person in particular wanted to be a doctor. Um, and just being, just hearing their conversations and speaking to them about that, some of the barriers that they were facing in their school in order to take that forward so there were you know they they wanted and needed some support with just the practicalities of the written assignments um and actually understanding the systems and all of that kind of thing and that was that was quite a pivotal moment for me i think in relation to the educational aspect because i thought here are a group of young people this one young person in particular they have aspirations, you know, they have a sense of who they want to be and where they want to go, but there are these barriers in place that, we, you know, we need to be thinking about how we can remove those for them and how we can help this become possible. Um, so that sort of sparked my interest in the education system, the psychology of learning, I suppose, um, and what we can do to try and support the overcoming of, of those barriers I guess um what kind of degree you need like to become that person I mean yeah just give us some kind of you know, understanding yeah how... sorry yeah yeah so to become okay. an educational psychologist you need your undergraduate degree in psychology mm -hmm. um and so with most of these things it's typically a 2-1 or above um but the, we can, they can look at equivalent experience um and then a good degree of experience after that so when I did my training I was at least two years of relevant experience in order to get on to the postgraduate um program it's not um termed by the the time anymore so it's not two years necessarily but you need a quite a wealth of experience in a relevant field to then apply to get on to the master's in educational psychology mm -hmm. and that's a two-year master's in Scotland followed by a uh, one year, what's called a qualification in educational psychology. Mm. So it's a bit of a um, controversial topic in Scotland because it's actually at doctoral level. So mm. at the end of the three years after your, four, uh, after your undergraduate, um, it's a three year postgraduate study. At the moment, it's not a doctorate in Scotland, but it is elsewhere in the UK. So it is in England and it is in um, Ireland and Wales. So Scotland's strange in that way, in that it's this mm. three years, but in two steps, two years of master's and then one year of a uh, qualification, which is largely based in practice. Mm -hmm. So yeah. like when you when you say like doctor, it's mean like professional doctor. Is that... Yes. Yep. Well, mm -hmm. professional training programs. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, like I mean, what kind of like when you say like practicing experience I mean yeah, yeah. what kind of settings you're talking about here yeah so um the role of an educational psychologist is very varied so yeah you're right to ask because when I say relevant experience that can mean a whole range of things um so you know educational psychologists we work in schools a lot we work with children and young people and we also have a role in training and research so people on our program just now so I, I'm a lecturer on the MSc 
educational psychology program in Dundee. So people on our program um, have a range of experience. So some have been teachers in the past, some have been support assistants in schools, some have not worked in schools, but they've um, been research assistants maybe. Um, maybe they've been part of voluntary sector, working to support children or families. Um, some have been speech and language therapists. Um, some have, you know, gone on to do a PhD in something and come back and want to um, apply that, apply some of their learning. So mm. it can be very, very varied. It's quite a, um, the application process for the MSc, it's very competitive. Historically, it's always been very competitive. Um, but it the the previous experience of people on the cohort it can be a really wide range like i'm saying which is part of why i think it's such a rich learning experience because we really encourage the students to get mm. to know each other to learn from each other mm. you know we're we're always saying you've got such a a pool and wealth of knowledge and experience in the room mm. please ask each other um you know about your past experiences and what you think of something because your perspective and your view will potentially be quite different or unique and we want to be able to learn from all of that so mm. we very much encourage people to bring their past experiences with them so, so like when you say like it's, it's very competitive i mean does it mean it has got better job prospect as well yeah, so our and this is a, a, a bit of a unique thing about our program as well so it's funded um so the Scottish government support the students in addition with COSLA, the mm. local authority groups. Um, so the two years is funded and the number of places that are on the programme, there's a bit of workforce planning behind it. So they, they, um, the number of students that we take each year is loosely based as much as we can without having a crystal ball on how many jobs there might be at the end of that so it is very much you know um i don't want to speak out of turn but i'm pretty confident that the that all of our students then go on to get jobs at the end of it mm. Mm. things are always changing but there is that link between the end of training and the number of students that we take on to start with like in terms of like job trajectory like I mean what can be the final destination like how yeah big you can be that's a great question I mean the first step in would be that you work in an educational psychology service in a local authority um so each local authority in Scotland has an educational psychology service um and they typically work in teams within those structures that are um promotional posts so you would maybe get a senior educational psychologist or a deputy and then a principal educational psychologist but because the role um I think obviously I'm quite biased <laughs> I think educational psychologists and educational psychology has so much to offer um I think we're in quite a unique position in many ways a privileged position too then some educational psychologists go on to work at um actually at government level and within Education Scotland, perhaps as well. Um, so there's a real, um, real opportunity, I think, to inform policy and guidance um, at national level too. You can do that as being an educational psychologist within a local authority, but, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of EPs do um, do that, but you can also, you know, the, the skills, I think, and the knowledge are really useful in many many realms some mm. eps have moved abroad i think that's it, it's interesting because you know we quite often if someone asks what does an ep do you might get different answers from different eps <laughs> but in america for example they they've kind of split things out a little bit they've got what they might call a school psychologist mm. which is maybe what you'd think about with a psychologist very much usually based maybe in one or two mm -hmm. schools and they work more directly with children and young people mm -hmm. and then they have educational psychologists which to me in my understanding seems to be more the academic um interest so they're maybe doing research into learning from mm -hmm. a more academic position and the school psychologists are those that are in school mm -hmm. in schools um in scotland we have a bit of a hybrid of this so we um 
very much try to span the research role and supporting you know new understandings into learning and what supports children and young people in educational contexts um as well as the direct sort of individual work I guess we do do work with casework etc but quite a lot of the time the EP's role is to work with the school system um, mm. or to support the adults around the child and that's because um, we believe that children develop or young people develop through an interaction between their environment and their what I would call like internal world <laughs> internal world and external world and that interaction mm. between those um is what can make a big difference for for children and young people mm -hmm. um i'm just like trying to like you know explore more like how does it work please. um yeah please do so like going back to your memory lane so you you finished your undergrad finished your post grad and then yeah like tell us about your first day in your job what really yeah. happened the first day <laughs> oh gosh, I am. Um, I can remember getting an email from a head teacher my first day in the job, and um, feeling completely overwhelmed because all it was a very complex. Um, there was a head head teacher had, had um sent this email to me outlining this incredibly complex feeling case. Um, there were issues with the family, intentions with the family. There was a child in the centre of it all who the school were trying to support. I really got the impression that the head teacher was just also feeling really quite overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And it was essentially an email that said, so please help us. <laughs> and I thought, my goodness, I've never been in this school before. I don't know this head teacher. I don't know anything about this child. Um, initially the thought was, what, what am I going to do here? But the training that we get, it's great because it prepares us for this kind of thing. So I guess it was in part, observing my own initial thought which was what on earth oh my goodness you know the usual imposter syndrome stuff where you just think they're asking me <laughs> you know all of that kind of thing then and this is why I'm really interested in self-regulation and executive functions then it kind of switched to you know remember your training you know you've got work through it in a systematic way um use your training frameworks and what's the next or the first thing that you might do next? Mm. So actually the first thing that I did next <laughs> was I went to find my supervisor and I sort of said, <laughs> this, is, this is what the situation is. These are my initial thoughts. And my initial thought was actually, I want to pick up the phone and speak to the head teacher rather than any complicated email back and forth where there, it seemed like there's more potential for things to get lost in translation. Mm. Um, this is my first thought and my supervisor was great and they were just very reassuring and they were almost like my second brain because they said you know yes you're right you, you work through your usual frameworks the way that you've been trained to do and see what comes next they're not right. expecting you to go in well they might be expecting you to go in with a magic wand and everything will be magic and amazing <laughs> but we know in real life real world contexts that's very unlikely to happen. So we just take what's what needs to happen next. What's the next thing that you need to do? And the next thing I needed to do was find out a bit more information and actually get more of an understanding about what the history of things was, um, what information was already available, uh, how the psychology of the situation was, you know, how were people feeling about it? Um, and if there was a role for me, because there might not have been, there may not be. Um, but I think what an educational psychologist or a psychologist can do is create a bit of space for people to think things through and to maybe have their thoughts reflected back and just explore a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know, a bit of a non-judgmental space to just think this through, okay, what might be happening what do we know? What do we not know? Um, yeah. Do you, do you like sit with like people, like, you know, both the students and the teachers? So it's yeah, a like yeah. kind of, you no. Know, my understanding because I, um, it's a bit of personal <laughs> kind yeah. of my connection with the psychologist. Um, I suffer from OCD. 
So obsessive yeah. compulsive disorders. I've been seeing therapies for like you know almost I think twenty years. Yeah, kids. <laughs> um, yeah. So like my understanding about psychology or you know yeah. therapists are just always one to one. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But yeah. it lo- it sounds like more it's a group setting or give us some kind of more insight on this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think that you're tapping into something that's really um, important. So I think that there can be a range of ways that different psychologists work. And I, I often think of this as like just with physiology, you know, there's all different mm-hmm. kind of specialisms of don't know like um endocrinology and geriatric care and like all these different kind of specialisms there are kind of similar things similar things with psychology I think in the world of psychology we're nowhere near as far down the line as we are in terms of physiology and kind of understanding how the body works um and knowing as well the body and mind work very you know they're very integrated but in psychology, there are various different fields within that too. So clinical psychology, mm-hmm. where typically there is a bit more individual work, although that they're sort of expanding out a little bit now as well. You know, forensic psychology, quite different again, sports psychology, all these different fields, and they've all got their ways of working, I think, and what, you know, different maybe objectives and client groups in educational psychology, I think one of the misconceptions is that we are just child psychologists and that we would work with children mm. on an individual basis or young people on an individual basis. And while we do do that, sometimes mm. it's had an interesting history, this profession. <laughs> and I think for a time that was the majority of work was sort of individual assessments and individual therapies and interventions mm. over time the nature of the role has shifted a little bit so that we are a bit more um, involved in working with the adults around the child or young person. So Mm -hmm. especially if there's maybe, say, a a child who's in early years of primary school, for example, Mm -hmm. um, usually what we would be keen to do is understand their view, first of all, you know, what the child is feeling and, and how things are going for them. But it's not always the case that's a stranger coming in. So an educational psychologist who they've never met before um, is the best person to actually support any change that we want to see for them. You know, educational psychology has got a very broad theoretical basis to it. But one of the things that a kind of overarching theoretical framework, I guess, is this idea that a child develops or a young person develops through the in- Um, the interrelationship between their external world and their internal world and a lot of the time the external world are the adults around them that they see most often so a class teacher for example certainly their parents um, and their peers as well so sometimes the most effective seeming way for an educational psychologist to support a situation is to work with the class teacher if it's an educational context and sometimes even at school policy level because we know that by intervening at that level it will also have an impact on the child and young person and they're the people they're going to see most often Mm -hmm. and that they're they've got a good relationship with um so you know if if an educational psychologist has say a a piece of casework that's open Mm -hmm. um in meetings we would tend to be part of a multi-agency or tend to be part of a bigger process than just um, ourselves and the child, for example. Mm. So it might involve the teacher, parent potentially as well, um, maybe some support staff that know the child really well. And Mm. really what's important is the child's voice, the child's view, you know, how are they feeling about things? And and Mm. that might not be or feel most appropriate. They might not want to come to a big meeting about them. and that's completely fine, but we need to find another way of trying to understand how the world feels for them at that point in time and you know, um, what their thoughts are on what might be supportive or not. Um, yeah, so it can feel, I think that our role as an EP nowadays, we recognize that we have knowledge and psychological knowledge and psychological skills that we bring to a situation, but Mm. we really want to um, be partners with other people who know the child or young person better, Mm. typically. 
you know so as much as we have we are expert in certain things we don't see ourselves as expert in the whole thing mm. because everyone's bringing expertise about the situation um and mm. our job is to kind of bring them together and see what sense we can make of it mm. Mm. in order to know the wisest next steps i guess does it involve any kind of one to one to one session like with a student or with a teacher yeah yeah yes it can do yeah it mm. can do yeah. and we would typically call that well it would typically start with a process we would call consultation okay. so yeah and that um would probably mostly start with maybe school staff because their schools are typically the people or groups who bring a concern to us so mm. it might begin with a consultation with a head teacher or the class teacher to just try and understand the situation a bit further and then there would maybe be a decision about whether or not an educational psychologist what would it, like would they would it be beneficial for them to do more assessment of the situation and the child and the classroom um and then if you're going to do a bit of assessment for what purpose so to inform an intervention and it may or may not be that the, the psychologist is the best person to do that but um they might have a role in making some recommendations at what that intervention should look like what it mm. should focus on um and when the point of review should be to see whether mm. or not it's made a difference um yeah mm. so yeah it's just, so certainly yes we we would definitely have a role in meeting with people on an individual basis it, it's just that the nature of that work can look quite different depending on what the situation is mm. like i mean in terms of like job situation like for example like dundee city council yeah i mean under it there are like lots of schools so it means lots of students lots of teachers yeah so like how many ep are there like educational psychologists there oh in dundee i don't know i th i would say maybe maybe there's like four, i want to say between 10 and 15 okay educational psychologists yeah so there's not one per school by any means mm -hmm. Mm. Um, and that can be uh, a big part of a big part of the educational psychologist sort of dilemma <laughs> challenge mm. is how do I decide which bits of work to take on? You know, mm. how do I make sure that I'm having most impact, knowing that I can't respond to, um, well, I guess I was going to say respond to all of the queries that are coming in, but. EPs would certainly try to do that. It just might mean that um, they're not best placed necessarily to be doing the individual work. There are lots of supports and um, systems in place within schools and in education authorities as well that may be better placed to do different pieces. So a lot of when an EP, sorry, I'm saying EP because it's easier to say than educational yeah. psychologist, but when an EP is um, involved in an early stage of a piece of work, they will be asking those kind of questions like, you know, why do we think that a psychologist is needed? Can we have an initial consultation about that, first of all, and just try and unpick it a little bit more? Um, and sometimes that's enough because mm. through talking about it and trying to think through, yeah, what are the needs here? Um, it might be that the need isn't necessarily psychological. It's that there's a need for, you know, the housing situation to be stable <laughs> mm. or some other big deal stuff that actually does need to be addressed. But that is maybe the thing that needs to happen now. Mm. And, you know, let's review it again in, in a few weeks or something or, or at some other point and see now what the situation is or, mm. you know, maybe we need to be contacting another service and support. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I think that that triggered a couple of questions for me. I mean, yeah. um, like in terms of training, like, do you know, like sometimes people who are practitioner, yeah. they train for the worst scenario, like you know, this yeah. is the worst scenario. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm thinking of, because uh, I've got two young daughters and during yeah. the whole COVID situation, they were in yeah. the, you know, so, the, yeah. my my family my partner works in nhs so like you know the whole family and i suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder yeah, so yeah. Like germ phobia so this is like kind of apocalyptic situation yeah. for me yeah 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 <laughs> very intense yeah <laughs> and i can now i can like imagine like how 
you know, people like, you know, those those practitioners, I mean, what yeah. they have been dealing with, I mean, it's, it's like serious things suddenly, you know, exposed yeah. in front of them. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. Like, what's your take, like, I mean, for those kind of scenario? Like, even if I talk to the teachers in the schools, I mean, and they always say that, you know, COVID impacted serious stuff on the students' mm-hmm. mental health. Mm-hmm. And, and I actually saw it. I, I was the witness for my two daughters. I mean, it mm-hmm. was the most difficult time for yeah. our lives as well. And yeah. Can you tell yeah, us yeah. some of the things, your, your own experience during that time? Because obviously you were also dealing with those practitioners. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that what we can take for granted, I think, is that when things are quite stable, mm. we're dealing with the normal ebbs and flows of life. And actually, at times, they can feel quite overwhelming. And then they come back and we think, OK, this is fine. You know, we've got it. It's OK. It's a stressful day. It'll get better. We, we've kind of trusted that line of thinking. When there are exceptional times like COVID, um, that becomes a more of a critical situation <laughs> because it's a bit more chronic. It's a bit more never ending. The intensity remains at quite a high level and that can do quite interesting things <laughs> to, for want of a better word, I think, to our own thinking styles and our own behaviours. And it's almost like a different state kicks in sometimes, I think. And that can be very, very challenging to come back from. Not completely unexpected at all. You know, I think throughout COVID, what I noticed myself. <laughs> so when, when COVID first started, I remember thinking, OK, this is OK. This is, you know, you've got these skills. You can think through, this is going to be challenging. I'm going to make extra food. I'm going to put it in the freezer in case we get ill. You know, all these practical things. I'm mm. going to make sure my family have all these things. I'm ahead of the game in terms of getting on the course. COVID was an incredibly busy time for us work-wise. I don't know what your situation was, but it it just, I mean, completely overwhelming almost overnight (laughs) Um, and required just that constant level of doing. Um, So I think, you know, what what I realized was while my skills and everything were were helpful at the start while things were still like okay yep I think we've got this Mm. what I found surprising was that how how (laughs) how almost like impressively that deteriorated so that ability to be flexible in my mind and sort of think okay well this is this is not going to plan but maybe I can try something else I just noticed that those skills in what I would think of as executive functions flexibility impulse control (laughs) you know just brain function working memory they completely deteriorated and while I would expect that as a more objective standpoint kind of stepping back what I hadn't noticed or hadn't expected sorry was how that was a thing regardless of whether I could rationalize it or not so like the physiology, the body sort of takes over, I think. Mm. Um, And for me, I guess, I mean, nothing terrible happened to me, thankfully, except for the fact that I think that period of chronic and ongoing stress Mm. Mm. probably has taken a bit of a while to (laughs) recover from. And I think that, I mean, I'm actually amazed at how quickly we've expected everyone to go back to Mm. normal. Um, because I think that for many people, I mean, I don't want, I'm not saying for everyone because everyone had different experiences in lockdown, but for many people, that was a period of quite chronic and ongoing stress, Mm -hmm. overwhelm. Um, and then all of a sudden we're sort of expected to go back (laughs) as if that never happened. Mm -hmm. And actually I wonder and hope that we can recalibrate to Mm. what we want to be new normal even though I'm not a big fan of that word and that terminology but you know what life is now Mm. um but what I think is important as well is to be able to actually now talk about what happened then how that felt for people what was very challenging exactly the kind of things that you're talking about you know the kinds of things where it feels like actually I regret that 
I, I wish that hadn't happened. Mm -hmm. um, but also it's okay that it did, you know, and if it feels like it wasn't okay that it did, okay, so how might I re repair that? Or what kind of things might I do to, to restore anything that I feel like maybe um, I, I would have liked to have done that differently? You know, what op opportunities exist now so that we don't just park it to one side mm. if it feels like there are things that we would want to still explore within that or things that we feel that happened through that time that need a bit more airtime in our head mm -hmm. or through conversation or or whatever that might be. Um, because I think that it 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 wasn't, for, for me, it wasn't like, whoa, this traumatic thing has happened on this one day. It was like an ongoing time. <laughs> of high pressure high responsibility anxiety um and in the moment it kind of feels like okay I think this is okay I think this is okay but knowing and noticing different behavior changes that aren't normal for me beforehand and thinking okay maybe this is having a bit of an impact that I hadn't expected and then coming out the other end of it mm. um which again is maybe unhelpful terminology. I think it's more like moving into the just time passing mm -hmm. and sort of just aware of even things like um, people's values changing. You know, I'd love mm -hmm. to speak to people about mm -hmm. what do you value now that you maybe didn't beforehand? And, you know, there will be many people who are doing research into this Um and, you know, how do you feel about yourself as a citizen and, you know, or as a, as a student or as a learner, what's important to you now? And everything, you know, yeah, I think, I think other things that are happening in the world as well. Um, mm. You know, how we process those things and how we give space to them and, uh, yeah, all of that kind of thing. I sort of wonder about all of that, I think. Mm. Um, I don't think that really answered your question no 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 because i mean i, I still struggle like what really yeah. happened you know yeah but i mean a couple of things like my my own experience for example um it's quite traumatic day to day you know yeah. um, it's not like you know you are facing some serious struggle it it it's like you you can also die yes that's the like kind of yes and, yeah, yeah, and, yeah and people are dying around you as well yeah i know yeah and and your relatives as well yes. you know? yeah. um, it's a, like continuous that kind of process yes. yeah and what you are saying is like chronic isn't it it's, it's yes. you don't know like when this will finish yeah, yeah. at one point it's like two years like one and a half yeah. years you know that kind of yes. thing yeah. Yeah. um but what i noticed like you know though our life was extremely difficult you know even day-to-day -day things i mean mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, teaching was we are doing online teaching. Lots of you know new things were coming. We have trained ourselves, yeah. and lots of frustration there. But also, yeah. I think that one thing I really remember is like people became more kinder, more compassionate yeah. about those things, yeah. Yeah. and we we became kinder to our colleagues as well. Yeah. Normally, we, we are not. We are always in you know, a fight with each other. <laughs> <laughs> about... <laughs> I know what you mean, though. That it can feel quite separate, but. Yeah, I saw that as well. Mm. And and like I was doing like podcasts every week and I was bringing my colleagues there. And then, you know, everyone is telling amazing stories. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, so that that's the like, you know, kind of try to find out, you know, like, I mean, how the homo sapiens actually, you know, their brain oh. works. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and also the adaptability as well. You yeah. know, how we totally. can quickly, you know, like make ourselves, yeah, we can we can pass totally. it through. Yeah. Um I kind of remember, like, you no, know, so I think one of the books I read, the, our earliest memories, like human history, is like we used to actually sleep on the tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Now we sleep on the bed. <laughs> oh, and oh gosh, I find this topic of conversation fascinating. And I'm really interested in how differently we live now. <laughs> compared to how we did as a species for I think it's like 99 90 or 99% of the time humans have been on this planet we were hunter gatherers yeah and just a completely different way of living compared to now where we're sat staring at screens and you know 
So I think some of the things that we see make sense if we think about it through that lens. Like our bodies will not have evolved at the same rate mm. that our lifestyle has changed. So mm. some of the, you know, the ways that we know, so, you know, and hunter gatherers would always be in groups, you know, collaborating. I think that brought some negative things as well. You know, people were ostracized and not included in that kind of thing too. Um, an anthropologist would know more about these things, but, um, you know, when we think now, you know, we work much more individually, we're less connected to people or less connected feeling to people anyway. Um, you know, that idea of what's your role in a team and, you know, we're working together, we're collaborating. We need to work a little bit harder on that nowadays because it's not immediately apparent who's going to do the the gathering and who's going to do the other bits, who's going to be getting the the home sort of watertight and secure, that kind of thing. Um, mm. And just many, many other things that we used to do, I assume, that we now don't. Um, and the impact... The, the the contradiction I guess or the conflict that would probably cause within our psychology and physiology because those things are now very different very very quickly over you know over a quick period of time mm. and I I think I noticed that as well through lockdown and just um I think it it really seemed to bring out the human in people a little bit more you know it was almost like while I'm saying I noticed for me anyway, like the executive functions, the sort of ability to problem solve and um, be strategic about things and all that kind of plan and all those kind of skills. I noticed myself, they deteriorated. Mm. What I also noticed was more like fundamental, just being much more open to people's experiences and really connecting with other people and feeling pain and feeling you know um yeah people's stories and just seeing other people as other people as much as we all think that we do that on a daily basis I think the whole context of COVID and the fear and the sense of perspective I think that that offered also stripped us back a little bit and just for me anyway um really put a bit of a spotlight on what's important and mm. just the being you know just the being of being human and mm. that brings with it a bit of vulnerability mm. and I think when we're vulnerable then we actually can forge stronger relationships sometimes <laughs> um because we're kind of saying you know this is us, you know, we are, we're pretty, um, yeah, we're pretty open to this thing that's coming along and um, could potentially do quite a lot of damage here. Um, so I think it kind of exposed a bit of that and in, and ultimately we could probably all do with being a little bit more vulnerable and being a little bit more open and um, yeah, just human, I guess, in mm. that too. Mm -hmm. that's that's a that's a real um benefit i think if we can hold on to those things from covid and lockdown mm -hmm. it, yeah i think it probably encouraged us all to see where our flaws are <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and and you know nothing to do but accept those and then think about okay how do i want to use that information that i have about myself to you know do whatever it is that I think would be helpful mm -hmm. I'm I'm kind of out of time because this is such a you know important yeah. thing so I, because I'm my plan is to I'll bring you back you know to talk oh, yeah. about things more um uh, like more lighter stuff like I mean um tell us about the things you enjoy in this kind of field I mean yeah um I am um, I'm just generally fascinated by people and what is a bit of a informal way to say it but basically what goes on between the ears <laughs> you know what goes on in our minds and in our brains and how that influences decisions we make and the our behaviors um I tend to think about things like a kind of biopsychosocial 
sort of model. Um, so knowing that each influences the other. So the kind of bio bit, meaning, you know, what are we maybe genetically predisposed to? And actually, there's probably a fair amount of our genetic predisposition that sets us up in a certain way from when we're a baby. Um, but also the epigenetic stuff. So that's, you know, when maybe certain genetic predispositions, they either present themselves or they might not, depending on your environment, you know, mm. and what's around you, the external world. So I'm very interested in that. And, and actually my PhD stuff started by me wondering what can we learn about the developing brain from like emerging neuroscience? We know a bit about it already, but that technology and that um, ability to actually look at brains and track them over time, you know, we're getting a bit more sophisticated in that way. And mm -hmm. is there anything that's coming through from that that is helpful knowing that it's still very much at an early stage? And I think that's the big caveat that we see images of brains and we see fancy MRI scans and we think, oh, this must be the truth. But actually, we really need to be critical about that because we're at an, we're at a pretty early stage, and to jump from seeing something on a brain scan to thinking, "Oh, this is what we need to do in a classroom," then that's a pretty risky jump. <laughs> I think there's a few more steps to go through um, before we're quite at that stage, or at least we need to we need to be cautious around it. Mm. Um, so I'm I'm really interested in that because I think that in educational psychology. I think we're really well placed to almost be like brokers of that information, mm -hmm. sort of bring the knowledge and, and research we're maybe aware of around psychology and kind of cognitive models, and then integrating that in some way with, okay, what are we learning about the brain as well and, and how that interacts with the environment and what might um, be useful in that way. Um, and then also, you know, hugely the social so I'm, I'm going like this because I'm thinking mm -hmm. of my biopsychosocial but the um the psycho so if we go to the psychology as well the the psycho bit just kind of things like what what do we tell ourselves mm -hmm. <laughs> you know that quote and I think it was originally from probably some sort of cognitive behavioral therapies but what what are you telling yourself you know and I asked myself that on a regular basis, at least once a day, mm. catch that thought. Is it that, oh, well, you know, that'll never work or this always happens or, oh, I knew it, you know, I'm a terrible person, whatever it might be, catch it. Is it true? You mm. know, mm. what else might be true? It won't be the whole picture. Mm. And just being curious about our own thoughts and kind of patterns of behavior and where does that come from? And, and, having that sort of um ability to just track and monitor what's happening between the ears <laughs> and that the stories that we're telling ourselves and asking where is that coming from um mm. and is that helpful to me or is it holding me back and that is where I think you know um therapies can be really useful and seeing a therapist can can really be quite useful in that because it's quite difficult to do that by ourselves sometimes mm -hmm. especially if we've been in a state of chronic stress or mm -hmm. there's something else and it there might be the bio bit that is just sort of overriding our ability to do that sometimes mm -hmm. um so to get some help with that can be quite useful sometimes um and and then the, the social bit I think that you know we have to acknowledge that it's not an even playing field <laughs> Mm. And things that contribute to chronic stress, you know, we're the state of the world at the moment, you know, that is something that we might not feel directly connected to, but it's there in our minds, you know, and we're thinking about it, just aware of, of it all and wondering, and I think the connecting the cycle and the, the, the cycle bit, I suppose, is, is really thinking about well, what can I do, mm. you know, instead of it being this massive cloud of anxiety or sadness or something, um, narrowing it down, circle of influence, we would talk about, you know, is there something I can do? What can I do? You know, what's within my area of expertise or knowledge or gift in some other way? What might I be able to do that might just, in, with the intention of making a bit of difference, if it can't be the whole world of difference, mm. is there a bit of difference that I can make? um 
in in some way and just breaking it down a little bit um and then obviously you know like I think we were you know mentioning chronic stress again a lot of a lot of people are living in chronic stress <laughs> mm. you know really challenging living conditions um you know we talk about support networks that's a wonderful thing it can also be you know the people around us or the groups around us the narratives around us mm. the norms around us they can be really helpful and sometimes they can also not be and that's the bit about connecting the cycle bit you know the what's going on in here mm. how aware can we be of the role that that is playing for us and 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 again just thinking through what is possible um mm. and this is all you know recognizing that and I, I just think that the world can be a very confusing place sometimes mm. there's lots mm. of conflicting narratives there's lots of conflicting mm. messages mm. you know or you just work hard and you'll get through it mm. you know no <laughs> sometimes people are are very you know they've been working hard they've been working very hard and they're trying their best but mm. there's just a systems barrier in place there's something there that's making it feel impossible to get through and we need to work at that level then you know we need to maybe mm. this is where the the political side of things comes in I guess you know how can we address some of these social changes that mm. we think would be helpful and and how do we do that as well you know mm. I think that it's quite important that it's not in you know experts coming in and doing something but it's sort of you know it's a process um that takes time I guess too but so I, I suppose it's sort of the bigger macro things mm -hmm. holding them in mind and being driven by whatever you want to be driven by and usually that comes by you know having a sense of what your values are and mm -hmm. where you want to make a difference that kind of thing knowing yourself you know what what your own limits and boundaries are that kind of thing and then sort of breaking it down right what might be the next thing or the you know the what might be something <laughs> that, that I can do um and knowing that it's it'll it, you know we shouldn't expect things to set it up and then I'll do this thing and it'll it'll be great it'll work and that kind of thing we have to expect the ebbs and flows as well I think mm. you know it's it's kind of always been that way I think that you know as humans we're we we have always dealt with big emotions um mm. and then had to sort of work through well, actually, what's helpful, what's not helpful. Um, and at times that can feel more chronic and at times that can just be the ebb and flow of a day. Um, but yeah, there are some some really big deal things happening um, mm. at the moment. And I think that that, yeah, it's, I guess it's the same process I would be, I would be thinking of. Mm. Mm. Um, I mean, like just one last point, I want to really bring it. Um, yeah. Because I mean, Yesterday was quite um, quite a day for me. I mean, it's obviously mm -hmm. you no know, the the situation in Palestine Israel was like yeah. really kind of you know exploded totally. And yeah. since I yeah. teach these things, my students are involved in these, so it's quite a bit of you know yeah. some kind of soul searching that what we yes. can do and cannot do. Yeah, but that's that's one thing. It's like you know over consuming. It's like yeah. almost consumed yeah. my life. Yeah. And then my daughter, the youngest daughter, came to me, and also the big daughter as well, and they came to me and said that Matthew Perry died. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like two kind of traumas because they have got lesser understanding about the political situation. Yeah. But suddenly I, I saw that, you know, they're seriously hurt by this news yeah, because yeah. The, this is the man they really you know his his creativity his acting yeah. his memories is this so yeah. so much good things brought to them i mean um yeah then suddenly i kind of switched off from that mm -hmm. you know the bigger picture and try to focus on like matthew perry and try to okay. you know celebrate his life yeah. with my daughter and and like more or less whole day we were talking about matthew perry yeah um i mean i don't know like i mean <laughs> no i think I... You, you you are a like psychologist the kind of you no know, it, it kind of brings some kind of calmness yeah yeah, yeah. 
I think that's wonderful that you sat with your daughters and and explored that with them and it sounds like you tried to understand mm. what it meant for them and really I think that is a lot of the job of the adults around children and young people and for young people as well to be able to bring that I think that is what development is is about in many ways you know it's sort of helping children and young people to actually even notice in the first place what's causing them upset mm. or difficulty um because it's, that's something in itself actually to even acknowledge it you know sometimes we feel something we don't know why but for them to to notice actually that's kind of upset me a little bit or you know that that meant something to me and then to have someone listen to that and not say you know oh don't be ridiculous you know but actually listen to it and and hear it from you know what is it they're experiencing and and what did he mean to them and mm. to try and understand I think that's really a lovely thing and will no doubt be you know supporting that relationship um and you're right it and also I think when we can like really get into and connect with someone else's emotions basically and feelings in a time it is immediately like it can bring more emotion to us as well but it is immediately all consuming I think because we're in that moment <laughs> you know and you're really forging a connection with someone and you're 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 not yourself worrying about the bigger picture and everything else that's going on to the into the world you're now part of two you know you're really listening to each other and you're understanding someone else's experience mm -hmm. um and I think that's and as easy and simple as you just made that sound <laughs> it's not an easy or simple thing to do a lot of the time because we are human as well and we've got lots of things running around in our brain mm. and when I was talking earlier about self-regulation I think that that role that an adult can play or a, and a young person you know children with each other just being a human I guess can play is actually it's hard to sometimes switch off the busyness that's going on in our minds mm. to really listen to someone else and and really want mm. to understand their perspective but that is hugely um my goodness that is just worth its weight in gold to be able to do that and just meaningfully connect with someone else and and I know that because you know I feel it myself but also from working in schools with different teachers and everything you know schools are busy places it's a pretty stressed setup I think in general at the moment mm -hmm. um and and also when and your teachers and staff try and do it all the time to just put that almost to the side and just connect with a child or young person just listen to them just mm -hmm. observe like what do you see what does it seem as important to them and help them try and understand what that means mm -hmm. and explore it it's kind of what we need as adults as well isn't it it's sort of sometimes we just want to be heard we just want to mm -hmm. someone to say I hear that and that sounds really difficult and I'm mm. sorry it's happened. You tell mm. me more, you mm. know, those kinds of things. Um, mm. And then it's lovely as well. If you ever feel like you can get to a stage of reciprocating, mm. you know, actually, I'm really glad we had this conversation. There's been quite a lot on my mind as well, mm. you know, and, and, and that depends on the kind of relationship mm. and that kind of thing. But um, mm. I think that sounds like a lovely thing you were able to do. Mm. because like i mean what like what i found like out of this whole this crisis situation and like matthew Berry's day i mean yeah. I, I tried to you know watch some of the older clips and like one of the things i found that there was actually you no know, tv interview with him and yeah. i saw like the the people are quite harsh on his life you know his oh, okay. addiction and those things okay yeah and and that really kind of worries me like why yeah. we, we we are so unkind to people you I know, know? I and know. that people are judging him that oh this is your fault you know why you're yes. not in control of your life yeah and he yeah. tries yeah. to explain that you know it's, yeah. it's, I, I cannot control some of those things yeah, yeah, yeah. my body works a different way yeah and and i saw a man was you know struggling to find kindness i mean Gosh. and and i think that the way our society you know, 
is going through now it's, it's all about you know lots of judgment lots of you know mm-hmm. unkindness and okay. that 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 worries me so i try to bring lots of compassion lots of kindness yeah. in, in yeah. our life yeah. but it's, it's difficult isn't it it's so difficult and i think that you're i think you're completely right and and again this is going back to i, I just feel like there's so many contradictory mes- messages everywhere you know there's like t-shirts with be kind on it and this like hashtag be kind and then at the same time we see on tv or you know in political spaces kindness not being modeled at all (laughs) you know and I think a big part of our role in society is to actually like have the conversations about it you know and what does kindness mean to you and what would it look like you know does that feel like it was kind or 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 not kind you know and is there ever a time where it feels okay to to not be kind or you know what would that look like and and to just actually have those conversations because if we don't if we don't learn about what these things mean to us Mm. we'll just get carried along in the wave you know our behavior actually is shaped quite a lot by just whatever feels automatic (laughs) and culture and society really drives that without us knowing sometimes Mm. so we need to be quite this is the cycle bit we need to sort of be thinking Mm. what am I seeing here and how does that resonate with me and yeah actually does that fit with my values or not why not if not (laughs) you know because it didn't feel very kind they've I felt like they were a bit disrespected there or you know in exploring some of these things that we notice that don't sit okay with us Mm. um or if we observe it elsewhere then then wondering how we might be able to challenge that in a respectful way um you know those kinds of things I think you're right I think that it's very easy to get caught up in the the hustle and bustle I guess is a bit of a cliche Mm. but Mm. it, it it feels like a very hostile environment sometimes that we live in at the moment you know and I don't know if that's because people can be quick with the remarks and they're very public very quickly and then it, it something explodes online and then it's all sort of unraveled very quickly. I expect that is something to do with it, um, which I think makes it even more important that we have the conversations about how we want to engage in the world and how we want to engage with people, mm. you know, what we want to be known for and what we want to uphold. Um, part of that, I think, for, for me and for most people is going to be self-compassion too because we're not going to get it right all of the time we're going to let ourselves down sometimes um often maybe but <laughs> what's important what's important is that we can reflect on it and think okay that wasn't great what do I want to do next time or what why did that happen I was tired and I was hungry <laughs> sometimes it's as simple as that or I was completely overwhelmed by what is happening yesterday so what might I want to do now, like now, to just catch that, you know, Mm. am I going to spend 10 minutes just sitting, free writing, just let it out, like what is it that's on my mind, what shape can I give to this, or do I just want to sit with whatever I'm feeling, just acknowledge it, and Mm. give yourself a pat on the back for the efforts that you are making, Mm. (laughs) you know, Um, and just come back to yourself. I, I think it, it's worth us all developing a bit of a doing a bit of a personal audit <laughs> who am I what triggers me what doesn't trigger me you know what do I stand for um and then a bit of a plan around okay when things are challenging what helps me um both on a daily basis and also on a preventative long-term chronic stress avoidance basis you know what what helps me to have built into my own systems in those you know to try and help give me the best shot of 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 doing and behaving in the way that I want to (laughs) thank you Gillian